What is the best way to start Dungeons & Dragons campaigns? Well, today we give you tips, tricks, and tools to ensure you kick off your stories with a bang. Boom. And not just fireball. Hello and welcome, heroes, to the Crit Academy. I am your host, Justin. And I'm your host, Ian. Uh, we, hope to prov- uh, ooh, we hope to inspire you with creative content that you can bring with you on your next adventure. Or in this case, prepping for the adventure. Yes, and we're super <laughs> excited. So we were actually just talking about before the show started how the hell we made it to 261 episodes without actually making a run, uh, running a session zero episode. So you think we would have started that in episode one, <laughs> or at least in the first 10. So obviously uh this is something that varies a lot when it comes to uh rpg games there are many different aspects this naturally means that each player is likely to uh kind of um latch on to something different Mm -hmm. and expect something different out of it um we've touched on this over the the years um on different types of players and dms in the past but there is more to it than that theme story combat and more uh that are all part of the the game and each player wants something you know more or different out of it but in order to truly understand and run a fun and engaging game for everyone at the table we all need to know what we expect from the game what it is that entertain us and why we want to be uh why are we at the table right and there's a lot that goes into that not just from dms but from players too for sure do you want to touch on that a little bit yep session zero is an aspect that the rpg community has come up with to help both the players and the DMs better prepare for a campaign adventure. In this episode, we will be discussing the variety of different aspects that can be covered in Session Zero. This includes what to include, why you should include it, and how to leverage it in a way that everyone has a great time. Now join us, share your thoughts during the show, that's what chat is for, and we want to know what you all think about Session Zero, what makes it successful, and what are some pitfalls that should be avoided. Right now, for me, one of the very first things that I like to touch on is the hard and soft lines in a game. Uh-huh. Everyone in the world has their own experiences in life, and they're unfortunately they're not all good. And so, as a team of friends and players, part of our job is to avoid doing anything that makes anybody upset. Now, I know there's probably a bunch of people out there, eh, snowflake, blah blah, whatever who it's all about caring about the people around you and if you want everyone to have a good time you need to know what the no-nos are and well this is the same chime just kind of a level of maturity there you have to gauge too yes um as somebody that runs games for a variety of age groups oh mm-hmm. that hurt um <laughs> uh i have to change the way i run the game based on the expectation and the maturity level of the game so when i'm talking hard lines I'm personally comfortable with blood, gore, and describing the breaking of bones and the gushing of eyes as somebody's eye gets ripped out. But not everyone is into that. Right. Whereas me, I'm, for the most part, my general mindset for me personally is I don't think any topic is off limits, but you have to do it right. And you have to know your group yeah and don't go and some things you just don't go into a lot of detail like i love the the trope so you got the horny bard for instance they want to go to the go to the whorehouse or whatever that's fine but i am much very much a fade to black because i don't want to know what's going on in there Mm -hmm. um and so for me that's a hard line that i draw at any table because i don't want to sit and watch people have um verbal sex in the table you know That'd be kind of weird. <laughs> um, there's some people that uh, want uh, try hard to avoid uh, the topics of like slavery or um, inc- the inclusion of children in in danger, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the first things you want to do is figure out where those lines are. A parent at the table with a newborn kid probably isn't going to want to hear about how they have to hunt down a uh, 11 year old girl that's been uh, soul has been you know taken or body has been in and uh possessed by some sort of alien monster um that's just not cool with them and that this is the opportunity to talk about that stuff and get it all out there so the dm can design the story and the encounters appropriately although i'd totally be digging that just because it's a lot of death and that's a lot more ambiguity and great to the situation which some people would love (laughs) that and that's another thing (laughs) ambiguity is kind of my jams but i know that's not for everyone right um nothing i posted saw just the other other day dude have you seen berserk and the content that's in it Yes, that's why it's labeled mature. 
Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of, there's a lot that that goes to as well. So um, when you're doing your session zero, for me, the red lining and the hard and soft lines is probably the first place to start. Um, next, you generally want to discuss the setting and uh, any particular limitations. Hey, Zipperon, welcome to the party. Indeed. Um, for what I mean by limitations, now this is something some players don't like. When the DM says, hey, sorry, my world doesn't have elves, okay? Or, or um, it doesn't have magic uh, at a high fantasy level. It's got low magic, like Lord of the Rings, maybe. Yeah. Um, so this is the time to kind of set those expectations. Is that session zero? Mm -hmm. Here's what we're playing. So everyone at the table knows what to expect and can build their characters. Because the last thing you want to do is have a Lord of the Rings setting and have somebody show up with a divine sorcerer who can twin magic and spew out fireballs freely, you know? Because um, even the wizards in Lord of the Rings don't really do that, you know? Yeah. Of course, it depends on which age you're talking about, too, but hey. <laughs> but back, in the back to it, right? So maybe maybe you can have the same world, different stories. So uh, what are some other setting, and, uh, discussing the setting and limitations you think that uh, should be brought up at session zero so everyone can build uh, uh, and enjoy the game? Well, something else that we kind of always mention is like uh, everybody has to be on the same page. Kind of what you already built off of is what is the theme? What style of adventure are you going for? Is it yep. going to be role play heavy? Is it going to be a combat heavy? Is it going to be a balance of the two? And once again, I just think it's a combination of knowing the DM, knowing who you're playing with. That goes for players as well. Absolutely. Um, and, and kind of falling on that Zipperon mentions factions. Yep. That's something that fits in the theme really well. So if you're at your table and you've got a group that says, Hey, you know, there's five players and three want political intrigue and the other two want dungeon crawl. Well, you can leverage the, the, that information and say, okay, um, the most, most want political intrigue. So let's take some of our settings. We've discussed that there's factions in, in, uh, forgotten realm specifically, you've got like the Harpers in the, uh, the the fuck what are they <laughs> i uh, don't even remember hoppers was alliance yes iron gauntlet um a lot of those different things so you can tie Sun them Dungeon. together and still feed the um the the dungeon crawl aspect by having you know competitive factions right um dalcinia says i had a game where magic was bleeding out of the world so players could actually take damage from casting spells past level one and it was 1d4 per level that is cool as hell i love that um, so when you're deciding on the themes, this is the time session zero says, I want our, I want uh, to focus on, mm -hmm. um, political intrigue. I want dungeon crawl. I want survival. Um, whatever it is, this is the time to talk about it. So once again, everyone can build mm -hmm. their characters appropriately. Yes. Uh, what does Dulcinea say there, Ian? Uh, well, as she was, well, as she was, uh, saying, she was playing a game where magic was being out in the world, so anytime a player casted something up above first level, they take 1d4 per level and damage themselves. Yeah. She also mentions that another game uh, had a really magical saturated land, same world, just closer to the well, whatever that is, which sounds cool, yep. uh, where even the non-magical classes got to pick cantrips. That's pretty cool! I like that! And, uh, um, and then there's Darwin. Yeah, I played a horny rogue, and we had a gangbang with three ladies and another player, and the DM didn't fade to black. <laughs> yeah, that's that's <laughs> not my jams <laughs> at all. But once again, that depends on the team and what your group is comfortable with. Yep. Um, and sometimes there, I think one thing that that's fair to acknowledge in session zero is you're not going to cover everything, no matter how much detail you put on it, and stuff right, will right. come up in games. Okay, to address it. Hey, can we? <laughs> And that's actually one of the points we want, I, we can jump on to really yeah. quick is um, things will happen that you won't expect, you won't have planned for. Them. So that having is. a plan to resolve situations like that can also be helpful. Yep. You know, that's that's part of the, the, the session zero to make the game better. Say, okay, if this happens, I will make the decision that I feel is best and we can discuss it after the game if it's the wrong one. Um, one thing I really want to talk about is called the six truths of the world now this isn't my idea this comes from sly flourish what are uh so at session zero he decides and shares with the players what are the defining characteristics of the world that the characters know but the players may not or vice versa to me that's really interesting because that really depends on how you want to build the game right yeah yeah so if you want to build the game where the characters themselves are, uh, I'm reading the Wheel of Time, you know, they're a bunch of little farmers and sheep herders from this little 
to Rivers and what they think they know is not really what's going on. Yep. So your characters would know a li very little, but you could share with the players, here's actually what's going on. So they're kind of aware of what to do moving uh, through the campaign. Uh, Garwin, I felt really uncomfortable the entire time we were walking up there for almost a half hour. We were worried he wasn't going to fade to black until he finally did. And by then, nobody was laughing anymore. <laughs> right. Uh, Jalcinia <laughs> says Ginny D does have some fantastic resources for hitting those hard lines. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think she has like a whole like checklist or something too. Yep. Um, so uh, definitely a good opportunity at Session Zero to talk about the, the truths of the world um, and set those standards. The one thing that I really love about Session Zero is an opportunity to build the characters together and form bonds with each other. Oh, yeah. yeah. Ah, Garwin, all I want to do is roll acrobats and then fade to black. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you're building strong bonds, for instance, yes. um, tying your characters together that's harder to do when everyone is just making it on their own and doing whatever they do. But yeah. as you're sitting there having a discussion about, Hey, I really like this idea of being this um, captain in the guard and the other guys like, I want to be a rogue. So what if you've arrested me in the past or more than once, yeah. you know, you can tie those stories together and those characters together very well at a session zero <laughs> without having to figure it out. The big advantage of that though, is it gives the DMs hooks and stuff to pull from, which is awesome. Yep. Welcome, Andrew. Glad to have you. Yep. Um, anything else? Is there anything else you want to tie into that with the Forge the Bonds? Some other ideas, maybe? And going off of that, the uh, they also touch on identifying the motivation for your characters for why they want to go on the adventure or how they tie into everything. And going off of that, what aspects of your characters do you want the DM to focus on? So I think that's a really good point, Ian. When you're when you're at session zero and you're forming your bonds, going on to why your character wants to be on adventure. I don't care who you are. You could be the best damn role player in the world, but if you show up and just aren't your character doesn't want to go on this adventure that I've that's been tossed in front of you. Okay, throw that character out. Roll one that wants to go on an adventure because that doesn't help anybody. You were part of the session zero. You knew what everyone's motivations were, and you built yep. this guy who doesn't want to go on the adventure. Well, I'm not gonna, you know, change it last minute like that unless I absolutely have to. And I remember one time too where I forget what channel it was, but they used the kind of the destroyer was Alex as an example. There was one point where they're going through like the dungeon area if, if you will and they never get to the next point they had to swim in an underground lake to get to the next section and like the rogue if you was like but i'm afraid of water oh <laughs> no and and it was a group like, like oh well and dove in and the rogue basically just like sat there with water for, for about a minute like, like nervous but then de breathed deeply and went they need me and, and, and dove in, in. <laughs> so to me uh, Shadow Wolf says, I just had a session zero as a DM. We had never played, uh, we had a, a player that never played, um, be a major tie to part of, uh, to part to get them excited. That is a really cool thing to do to get a new mm -hmm. player in, uh, into the game. I would, uh, Shadow, I would give you some advice to be careful about doing that too much yeah. outside of that, yeah. because it's easy to make one character shine over the rest. And that's something, um, as game masters, we want to try to avoid, but getting, using that as a hook to get them in is genius. Kudos to you. Mm -hmm. Um, you want to, what's and, Delcinia saying right there? And Delcinia like, she has two campaigns going on right now. One had no session zero and she like literally cried with stress trying to get the party together and the campaign to start. The other one did have a session zero and was way more fun to play. And that's a really, really, that's a pretty common thing. Unless yep. you're a DM that can just do it on the fly and some can and, and, and amen to you for being able to do that. Cause yep. I can't do that. And I think some players can acknowledge you like, okay, technically I don't feel like my character would do this, but this is the game and we do need to move along. So, right. um, <laughs> oh, and, well. <laughs> and kind of touching on the motivations and what you said earlier, yep. this also gives you an opportunity to tell the DM what you want your character to focus on. My character is seeking revenge for yep. somebody that killed his dog, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the DM can take that and turn it that he's now part of this whole ex-assassin thing and, and is out for blood because somebody killed his dog that his wife gave him. If you don't tell your DM that, they're just going to make what they right. think you want. It's better just to say, I want this to happen with my character. And Session Zero sure. is the best way to do that. And when the DM makes what a player thinks they want, results are definitely going to vary. They're about <laughs> as random as the D a D20. <laughs> yeah. uh, actually, kind of an interesting point, too. This is not really a Session Zero thing, but there are points where like some character players will go, oh, my character would never do that. And I, they should not be saying my character would never do that. What they should be saying is, okay, what would make my character do that? 
That's a, I like that. That's really good. Yeah. That's a, that's a good player tip. We yep. should write that tip out. <laughs> kind of why I said with the, uh, the whole, I'm afraid of water. I can't swim kind mm-hmm. of thing earlier. It was like, it was like, he felt, he felt responsibility for the group. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't see him. That's, but I don't, I guess that's not necessarily the, the, the best uh, example, but yeah, you get the idea. Yeah, I get you. <laughs> um, the other thing that I think really is, uh, great to discuss at session zero and we were just having a discussion about this thing before the show started about whether you are rules heavy rules light or rule of cool type of table because not every table is made for every no player um and as we were saying i was just saying we we have this we just had a discussion about this where Mm -hmm. some people may like one thing or another maybe they want the hard fast rules they want to know exactly what my character is capable and don't want it wishy-washy and that's okay that's the time to talk mm-hmm. about this whereas like i've been in some sessions too where like i was playing with a group who are hardcore into immersion like mm-hmm. like sound effects music and everything but i got to the point where like okay this is getting really distracting because because the volume is way too high and so mm-hmm. on and so forth absolutely <laughs> it's, it's like they push emotion show hard they actually took me out of the game <laughs> <laughs> if that makes any sense yeah i and there is a lot of just there's a lot of things that can be distracting so that's another thing you can bring up in your session mm-hmm. you know what do we want in the do we want music in the atmosphere do we want to uh-huh. dim the lights you know how involved do you you want to uh want to do it get into that and, um and also we had a couple of character concepts to toss out through there kind of interesting like one guy like i had a fighter who who had the soldier background but was an archaeologist and he knew the rogue who was good at scouting and knew how to find traps <laughs> See, and that's a that's a really great example because you managed to tie the two right. characters together. That's awesome. This is also session zero is also a time to talk about one of Ian's favorite thing, uh, battle map, or my favorite thing, theater of the mind. Or are you going to have a mix of the two? Do the players need to be bringing minis? Yeah. Are they going to be using them regularly, or is it going to be a, 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 a occasional thing for the big complex boss fights? Yep. And both theater of the mind and battle maps have their place, and p- different people get things out of them where like or people's like impressions can be different like you like for example you've said you at times find battle maps too limiting i'm like for me it's the exact opposite <laughs> absolutely and and that's why once again that's another reason why it's it's important to as a team to figure out this stuff at the at the table ahead mm-hmm. of time because if it wasn't for ian i probably would never use a battle mat as a gm it's my responsibility to make sure i'm giving him at least some of what he wants i know it's probably not as much as you would like but i try to make sure i include that because i know that's a part of the play that he really likes i also realize the fact it's not just me at the table either so well i say you because you're right. here sitting next to me that's fair but, <laughs> but it's still um, a valid point to make. right and, and and once again that's something that um is discussed um, during the session or during the, the session zero. So I know to in, include those sorts of things. Um, what uh, do you think about building out a plan ahead of time to do what to do about when somebody doesn't show up? Oh, and um, Matt, Matt's like, I remember seeing Ian doing a monthly campaign with people at the local store where they used a uh, plastic transparent tarp with a grid and used dry erase markers to build a battlefield. Yep, I've done that. Yep, many times. that's a that's a really great way to do that. Uh, oh, and like uh, Sh- Shell, ah, Shell Wolf actually makes an interesting point too. Like, what what rules are allowed? What races? And uh, are third party books allowed? Absolutely. So. Uh... There are some DMs that will let you use whatever you want. There's others that will only stick to Watsy. Um, if you only stick to Watsy, I would like to give you just some advice. Consider expanding out to some of the third-party content yep. people. Um, I'm not just saying that because right. I publish some of that stuff. Um, but because there are – Wizards of the Coast makes great content. But there are other people out there that make amazing content too. Yep. Um, but both approaches are understandable too. So, anyways, back yeah. to where I was saying. Yeah. Mm. Uh, building this is an opportunity to discuss with the team what to do about that when somebody doesn't show up. Yep. So, are, is the DM going to just zap them away and everyone's just going to pretend they don't exist? Is the DM going to just RP them? Uh, is another player going to yep. take over? This is yep. the time to to talk about that, and it can really help when that do, when that doesn't happen. Likewise, at what what range do you decide to stop playing? If you've got four people, will you go missing two? Yeah. Or will you be like, if we'll miss one, that's great. If it's two, we'll do something else. Like, I remember like the game I used to run for my brother and who in that group. They, there was about four players there, mm-hmm. and like you said, we never really discussed it as a group. I suppose in hindsight, but the, for the most part, though, we assumed the character was present, but in combat was not necessarily active. 
But if they were like a spellcaster, for example, we, we might tap their character for some buffs ahead of time before we, we walk into what we know will be combat. Yeah. But then, uh, but other than that, have them take a step back. Yeah. Uh, Andrew says, as an owner of Forgotten Feats, I got to recommend third party stuff. Yep. I sure hope he's saying fantastic feats yeah. or maybe just plugging somebody else's content yeah. on our show. Because, <laughs> like, I remember one time too where a Dragon Age I used to play with, I should have linked to a game one time. And I was like the one spell, the only spellcaster in the group who knew healing spells. So they ran that character without me. And when I finally did show up, I was like, oh, my character's unconscious on the ground in the middle of the fight. <laughs> that leads into a really good segue into what session zero is a great place to yeah. talk about what are you going to do about character death? Yeah. Is it permanent? Is it a slight inconvenience? When somebody gets dropped to the ground, is there going to be. Uh, what is the the repercussions, if any? Um, this is the time because character death is inevitably going to happen in your game. Happened Friday. Um, yes, sorry, <laughs> Ian. I don't apologize. Merle got the shit kicked out of him by animated chains, and it was glorious. You rolled that twenty. I roll. I roll that one on my death save. You delivered the third hit. <laughs> sorry. Um, but anyway, so character that session zero, you want to talk about that because it is very easy to get attached to your characters and not want them to die you want them to it can be sad i cried yeah. one time when one of my characters i played a character for like six years and then it died and i was like no how many years did i play Merle before at this point it's been a while yeah so because you started the evidence campaign yeah yeah <laughs> so at least three at yeah. least anyways uh oh shadow wolf says i remember my first ever dm let me have a one-on-one -on -one session as i messed some key parts i missed some key parts where i had uh to miss because of work and so i uh, wouldn't feel left out that is really really a great thing to do yeah, yeah. um yeah matt roll up had a chance he didn't roll in that one as death save that did not do any favors that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> right um so uh the other thing i think is important to discuss at session zero is the handing out of loot mm -hmm. um i don't know about ian i can only speak for myself i've been in groups with greedy ass players yep um, and it drives me insane. It is horrible. Some people suck. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I definitely didn't know that. Like my my brother, I like him, but he's running a barbarian character, especially at levels and came across like, mm -hmm. him, but that's mine. <laughs> <laughs> and that's in that session zero is the time you're gonna yep. want to talk about that because um yep. and, and, and to be fair though, he was at the time a relatively new player too. So <laughs> and and I definitely looking back, like, yeah, I've had some of those behaviors too when I first started out, so I can't really fault them too much yeah. for that. I mean, and I it, can, but and no. it's kind of like in in <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I can't. Yes, I can. Um, but 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 I'm just saying, I realize that some of those that stuff comes with experience too. Yes, and and um, ooh, yeah, that's a good point too. Shall shall well, are you guys doing milestones or XP leveling? That is a great one. Me, I ditched XP leveling uh, years ago. I got yep. so tr sick of tracking that shit. And I got sick of making sure they got enough combat to go up to the next level so I could take them to the... Uh, now, I know I, I would like to hear your opinion on this because me, yep. I feel like we are able to complete more content through more of the books because we go through the milestone. How do you feel about that? Overall, I think I do prefer milestone overall too. Although I will mention with XP though, most people apply it for combat, but a lot of, I've, I've seen a lot of other RPGs or DMs just to be how to roll for, for, for fifth edition okay, you didn't kill these guys, but you managed to roleplay your way around it, so I'll still give you the experience for that combat because you still dealt with it in a way. Yeah. <laughs> See, and that, there's some DMs that don't do that. Yeah. And that drives me nuts. Yeah. I remember I managed to bypass an entire combat encounter by using uh, uh, rations uh, and press the digitation to, to flavor them, and it worked really well in one session. In another session, I did the same thing, and the damn wolf still ate my ass. So, do you remember that, don't Phrasing. you? Phrasing! Were you there? Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> Anyways. Um, We're not one more bypass combat with a clipboard. <laughs> um, Sample so, inspection! <laughs> uh, Dalsinia says, Oh my word, the looting thing has been a thorn in my side for so long. The first campaign as a rogue who keeps looting, stealing all the golden items I give them, and I can't get him to stop. Any advice? Yeah. Talk to them. 
talk to them about it. <laughs> or if uh, if they're going to keep doing it, make sure there's repercussions for that. Yep. Um, maybe a player doesn't spot them when they take it. Maybe somebody else does and reports them for theft to the authority. I'll tell you what, the magistrate takes theft very Ooh. seriously. Yep. And something you want to t- touch on with milestones, though, is make sure you deal out the levels appropriately and in a, in a uh, timely basis. Because, hey, let's be real here. Players do like to see their characters improve. They love leveling up. They, they see what, what new things can I do next. And B, th- think how annoyed some players would be like, okay, we just gone through how many dungeons and we're still level three? <laughs> yeah, I can understand that. And I might be guilty of that sometimes. Um, uh, I'm not calling you on particular. No, 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 no. no I know. Yeah. But I know, I know I am guilty of that. <laughs> the one thing that I uh, I want to uh, uh, touch on before we, we move on here is mm-hmm. when you're uh, in regards to Dulcinea's question about the thief um, in the episode we covered called Law of Lands, mm-hmm. there is a systematic guide for punishments. And I'm pretty sure theft is uh, gets you prison time. So if you if somebody catches the rogue stealing and they get prison time, make that player roll a new character until that time yep. is up. Mm. Coin scarabs tend to sweet him. <laughs> oh, yes. I love me a good coin scarab. The team spent three rounds debating whether to save him or not, and he still does it, even after they th- talk to them. And sometimes, you know what? This is actually a kind of a good point to touch on. I'd let him die. Okay. I think sometimes during a session zero, I think it's perfectly mature, as long as you do it in a mature way, to step back and go, you know what? This might not be the game for me or the group for me. Yes, absolutely. Um. Or maybe the DM, like, here's what I want to do for the adventure. And the, the players go, we're not interested in that. That might be a good reason to step back and go, okay, what would you guys like to do instead? Yep. And that's perfectly reasonable, too. <laughs> yep. And that's, and that's, some people, uh, how do I say this without sounding like a, well, I always sound like a dick. Hey, gaming out stubbornness. <laughs> yeah. Um, some people will be very stubborn because they want something. Mm-hmm. Um, if you've got a group of five players and one person is bitching and moaning because they're not getting what they want they may not realize that they can step away from the table. It is perfectly okay to say, you know what? This is the way we're going to run it. It may not be the table for you. So uh, if you want to bow out, that's fine. We'll contact you when you're, when we go to a different gameplay style. And I've definitely known, I've let some games go on for way too long too. either both of the players as a DM, because, because I kept thinking it'll get better. It'll get better. It'll get better. But sometimes you have to do this pause and then go, you know what? I'm not having fun. Why am I wasting my time? <laughs> Absolutely. And that's okay. <laughs> Just be civil about it at the very least. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Tessinia did try the uh the coin scarabs, but the guy still uh yeah. still and did jail time, and the new character still does the thing. Wow. Well, make jail time longer. First fe- offense a month, second offense yeah. a year. Ten yeah. years later, he's still in prison. <laughs> Maybe you even let the other players put they put him in a stockade and whip his ass. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And and Shadow Wolf once again mentions like this might sound horrible as a DM, but he does allow PvP within limits. That's actually a good thing to establish too. Oh yeah, is PvP allowed? I didn't even write that down. What the hell is wrong with me? <laughs> and on what level? Because I remember like one discussion we've I've seen in the past too. I was like, okay, I do allow the characters to fight, but I never had them roll initiative, and I never had them actually inflict actual damage on each other. It's I, just I, uh... I just let them role play it out. And I like that. And I can definitely see be be contested checks too. Oh, and she and she says she even used jail time with an, yep. in the new character and still does it. Yeah. And you know what? Even Make though this is not, even though this is not the topic, sometimes it's okay to acknowledge I have a pot problem player. It's sometimes okay to just cut a player go saying, yep. or you could talk to him say, hey, look, this is a problem. The team doesn't appreciate it. Sounds like if you did. can't, if you can't, if yep. you, they can't, if they don't agree to stop, just ask them to leave. It's better to have one less problem player. And uh, then have to deal with it. As you've already established, they've talked to that player multiple times already. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the the as the PvP thing, I think that's really good because I allow PvP. If you guys want to kill each other, I don't care. Roll a new character. That that doesn't bother me. But not every table can do that. Yep. And I know that there's some players I play with that can't handle it. Yep. Um, and those players can walk away whenever they feel. But I don't think I ever get it. Let it get so bad. Uh-huh. Um, that it's become a, a consistent problem. Though I really do like um, mind manipulation powers a lot, hmm. um, and I like to take control. Uh, I don't take control from the players, but I do like turning you guys on each other. Yeah. I'm a bad DM. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, something that, that you could touch on during like a uh, session zero too is like, um, hey, is as weird as it sounds, who rolls skill checks? 
Ooh, that's interesting. So um, some DMs like to do that. And I can see the argument on both sides of this one because I can definitely understand like uh, players going, it's my character. I am doing these these th things. I want to be the one who rolls the dice. And you know what? I completely understand that. <laughs> and I definitely see some DMs who like, I prefer to roll the dice because at the end of the day, the players know how well they've rolled one way or another. Or another because they saw the dice, they see their skill modifiers, right. and they can react according to what the number was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think we're running out of time here for yeah. our uh, main topic. Is there any last uh, things you think are important that we should touch on? And I just wanted to reiterate re re once again, players in DMs, during session zero, when you do have it, if you feel like this is not the game for you, just feel free to say, this it's not the, the game, game for, for me. me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'm right there with you. All right, I think that'll do it for our main topic. Uh, yes, this is Katara. She's my poppers. Yep. She's one of the smartest dogs I ever had. I love her to death. She's so cute. Um, so, yeah, that's our, our main topic. Uh, thanks to everyone that was in, uh, involved in the conversation. I love yep. uh, I love hearing the feedback and seeing the challenges that people ran into. So how about we uh, move on? Mm -hmm. Hey, Crit Nation. Man, it feels like just a few weeks ago we posted something about adorable creatures for our game. And man, were our wishes answered. We just found out about an awesome new 5e game full of adorable little creatures. Fates and Furhaven just funded on Kickstarter and we are so excited about it. The world of Aloria is a place of mystery and danger where adorable creatures undertake dangerous quests to protect their families and homes. The main hub of commerce and civilization is a settlement known as Furhaven, a large community of humble furs from throughout the forest, pastures, and sunny spaces. Furhaven is an exciting campaign setting for 5th edition, full of colorful characters, magical items and spells, new races, and daring adventures. The adorable Kickstarter comes with boxed game bundle for ease of use for even the smallest youngling in the family. Back it today, rebrand.ly slash crit furhaven and pick up a free the adventure of the lost library. And now, what you've all been waiting for. Our Unearth Tips and Tricks segment, where we bring you new and reusable material for both players and DMs. All right, and kicking up the UTT section is our character concept. We have Amala Shadow Dancer, who's a female human. Description-wise, she is a petite redhead who wears black leather with open lace gloves that run up past her elbows. Her purse contains an intricate mask-like tattoo. A reminder of her pact. Ooh, so we got some warlock action going on here, maybe. Ooh, ooh, ooh. When she speaks her soft and enchanting voice, it belays the dark power she holds. Amala is soft-spoken and a bit reserved. She has been hunted by would-be heroes most of her life. People who think her as a shadow spawn. Despite her timidness, she is quick to conjure dark power to aid any who may be in trouble. This is doubly true for young children. She carries the skull of her mother and ha uh, has an unusual and strange obsession with it. She was gifted the ability to create undead guardians and access uh, to magic granted by her pact. While the, her powers may be dark in nature, she spends her life using this darkness to protect others from threats. But unfortunately, this leaves her as an outcast. Her power is misunderstood and thus is always hunted and mistreated. Motivation-wise, when she was young and broke her pact, its sole purpose was to gain power so she could protect herself and others. She travels from villages to cities seeking to volunteer and pay orphanages. She takes on tough jobs and donates all of her earned coin to the shelters in the area, all to ensure that others don't have to turn to darkness to survive. What do you think about this? As weird as this sounds, the character that actually came to mind was actually Genkai from Yu Yu Hakusho. I love Genkai. Damn wit! <laughs> Just because I'm 
because I remember when she was fighting a demon at one point who was sick of her because she was a hero of justice. Mm -hmm. And when she's just being a crap guy, she's like, okay, let's make one thing clear. I am not a hero of justice. I check out everybody who's in my way. They, they all just happen to be evil demons trying to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so this one was a, a fun character to create because it's somebody that turned to dark power because they had no other choice. Whether they were trying to protect somebody, in this case her, her family, which obviously didn't work, but she's now using that darkness. But this stemmed off the idea that necromancy is always considered bad. Um, and it's inherently not great, but it isn't, mm -hmm. it isn't based on an alignment or anything, nope. you know, some people may just consider the using yeah. of dead skeletons recycling. Yeah. And I think some people do forget that just because a power might have a certain stereotype does not necessarily mean it's tied to alignment. Absolutely. Like I remember one time, one, one player gave me grief, like, he's like, you picked to inflict wounds. Yeah. But that spell's evil. Why is it evil? Because it's necrotic. Necrotic magic is evil. How's it more evil than lighting something on fire with a <laughs> fireball <laughs> or I'm smashing their face with a hammer. You know, yeah. it all is on based on intent. Yep. yep. Cure wounds is also a necromancy spell and all the resurrection spells too. Yep. They just, the only difference between a necromancy resurrection raised dead and resurrect, uh, true resurrection is one is the original soul. <laughs> yep. So anyways, that'll do it for our character concept. Amala shadow dancer. Yeah. Our monster of the episode is the Defiler. Now, in order to build this, we're going to start with the Dryad, because why not? Um, you are going to lose some features of the stat block. Uh, languages become uh, demonic or abyssal or whatever you, you choose. We're going to lose the current spell list. Speak with beasts and plants become speak with dead. Tree stride is gone, and so is fey charm. Yep. What are the cool things, uh, new spells that we're gonna get, Ian? Well, can't your boys? We're gonna get Eldritch Blast and Spirit the Dying. Three times per day, they can use False Life, inflict wounds, <laughs> and Raven Feeblement. Nice. And once per day each, they can use Animate Dead, Darkness, and Vampiric Touch. Nice. And. They also get Devil Sight, which they can see in darkness, both magical and non-magical, and to a distance of 120 feet. That's so nice. Handy. So, check out this new feature called Soul Reap. Now, this is a variation on the one of the Necromancer uh, wizard spells. When our features, when the Defiler kills a creature with one of its spells, it can reap the life energy away from it. Once per turn, when the Defiler reduces a creature to zero hit points with a first level spell or higher, it regains hit points equal to twice the spell's level. The Defiler doesn't gain this benefit on constructs or undead. And we're going to top it off with a really fun reaction that I realize now I didn't actually give a name. Uh, the de Defiler can impose a demonic black void between itself and its enemy. Tell me if you recognize it. Yep. When it is attacked by a creature within 30 feet that it can see, it can use its reaction to impose disadvantage on the attack roll, causing a black void to flare before the attacker before it hits or misses. An attack that can't, an attacker that can't be blinded is immune to this feature. Yeah, that might be kind of dangerous and hard to deal with. <laughs> yeah. Do you recognize it? It does sound familiar. It's the uh, cleric uh, uh, warding flare. Ah. Um, so on the screen right now, you'll see the lovely art piece we have for this monster. Um, if you don't know, uh, our patrons get full stat blocks with lore and history and all that stuff from our show. Um, and they come out really, really cool. That artwork is beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. It screams Defiler. It also screams uh, uh, Amala Shadow Dancer. <laughs> um, all right. What do you think about this, uh, this, this monster, uh, Ian? This thing be dangerous and definitely using some like a warlock like uh, symbiosis. Yeah, I like the the fit on the uh, false life for defense, eldritch blast, spare the dying to heal people. Vampiric touch is a very fun power to use against people, um, not people like characters. <laughs> um, and it fits that that kind of mix of uh, warlock and uh, uh, wizard feel. So yep. Uh, all right, that'll do it for our monster, the Defiler. Ian, would you like to tell us about our encounter? On the run. While the characters are walking along a busy road or through a town thoroughfare, a petite, dark cloaked figure bumps into him recklessly, apologizing with itself, excuse me. Seconds later, twin armored swordsmen with an emblem of a golden hammer smashing a skull on their chest. That's the logo, not what they're doing. That, <laughs> that's through asking if they saw anybody 
anyone saw which way that filth went. A successful wisdom insight reveals that something is off. Ooh. Why would they band to apologize after bumping into them? <laughs> a character with a successful intelligence history check recalls the emblem pertaining to a group of paladins who hunt wizards to raise the dead, known as necromancers. They kill themselves as slaves of darkness and believe it is a foul magic that goes against nature itself. The truth is that the petite, dark-cloaked figure was a woman by the name of Mala Shadow Dancer, a defiler. She is a spellcaster who, during terrible times when she was young, was forced to, into making a bargain to save her life. She is now a force for good, but her dark magic implies otherwise to many who lack understanding. The paladins seek to slay her, as they only see her as one who walks in the shadows. Yep. What do you think? Why? It sounds like as if we gave the character cast that we gave second go a stat block and an adventure <laughs> to have them. <laughs> yeah, it was actually pretty easy to tie. I tied it all together. No kidding. Um, kind of reminds me on some level to a degree of the Templars from Dragon Age. Yes. Which I mostly thought about because I was talking about Dragon Age in the comment section. But well, when I wrote this, it was uh, I'm. I keep saying it. I'm. I'm reading uh, Wheel of Time. So. Yep. The white cloaks uh, and the Aes Sedai yep. and the, the battle that's going on. This is kind of that feel, right? Yep. Andrew says, if making a humanoid monster a named NPC, give it a spell scrolls for spells it might not normally be able to use, messes with your players. That is amazing. And yep. that is going to have to be a dungeon yep. master tip. And for those <laughs> of you who don't know, with, with Dragon Age, the Templars have a very anti-mage Mage, and I usually keep all of them locked away. And as a player, you might initially seem like, well, that's kind of a dick move and intolerant. But when you see what happens when mages lose control, then all you their realize, powers, you're like, you're oh, like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> this is not out of nowhere. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this is a pretty straightforward encounter. Um, it's meant to be something that happens in passing if you want to introduce a defiler or a, a character like Amala, or you can replace them however you want. Um, but this really is a great opportunity to set up a group of paladins who believe they're doing the right thing but aren't um and which totally screams white cloaks to me or they could be doing the right thing but for the wrong reasons or vice versa that's also true maybe that maybe they just don't understand that just because you can use necrotic powers doesn't mean you're evil you know or they or they re received a tip and they're going off that and the person who gave the tip was the one who didn't understand that's good i like that so there's a lot you can do with on the run here so oh yeah um, Yep, that'll do it for our encounter on the run. Our match item today is the Glamour Prism. It is a wondrous item, common, and we give credit to Vivid Steel for submitting this. Yep. A Glamour Prism is a crystalline prism that has been enchanted to project the image of one thing onto another. A Glamour Prism can be used to make a set of leather armor look like a summer dress, or like a set of Magitech armor. This is a Final Fantasy XIV item! Uh-huh. You can use an action to glamour the image of an item onto your possession onto another item in your possession, consuming the prism in the process. The items must be similar in nature and shape to one another. The objects must be similar in type, such as like clothing can be made to look like armor, whereas an arcane book can be made to look like a cookbook. But like cloak can be made to look like a book. And that kind of makes sense. <laughs> Fair enough. And um, the object cannot be more than five feet on any side. And the changes wrought by this item fail to hold up to physical inspection. If someone attempts to touch the object, the hand will go through through the illusion and feel the item underneath. Once glamoured, the illusion can only be re removed through another glamour prism to apply a different glamour. Casting the spell magic or similar effects on the object will also have work too. This feature lasts until dispelled or you use an action to apply this effect again. I love this. I love Final Fantasy fourteen, and I don't know why. After putting this in here, I'm just realizing it's from Final Fantasy fourteen. Um, this is really cool because not only can it have fun uh, applications, but this totally can be used to um, uh, as a, a, a tool for deception, right? Yeah. Uh, and then you can almost replace the disguise kit with something like this, which I think would be really fun. But I like the idea of just having this prism that allows you to change the weight, what clothes you're wearing by look, mm -hmm. but doesn't actually change them. That sounds very, very cool. What do you think, Ian? Yeah, I think you definitely have a lot of fun with this one. And the fact that it's a common item means, in theory, you, you should be able to get them. this fairly cheap. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Silver Wolf is like, this I had of disguise. This plus the head disguise. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's perfect. I love it. Yep. 
Uh, all right, that'll do it for our magic item, the Glamour Prism by Vivid uh, Vivid Steel. Our Dungeon Master tip of the podcast is well met on the road. This comes from Dungeon Magazine 121. Do you, uh, excuse me, do your PCs assume that everyone they meet on the open road is an enemy ready to attack them? To be fair, <laughs> <laughs> that's usually what happens in a lot of games. <laughs> Are there re enemies ready to attack them, kill them, or rob them? Perhaps that's because most people they meet on the road do just that. Exactly. But the roads of a prosperous nation, for instance, should be filled with innocent travelers who are more likely to shy away from a band of weathered adventurers or travel with them for added protection. For some examples you can include in your in your uh, travels, a group of rural ranchers, rancher, a group of rural ranchers uh, taking cattle to a butcher in the city, maybe a young couple that has been recently married and are just on their heading towards their honeymoon, you know, little cans dragging yep. behind their behind their horses, or perhaps horse drawn caravan carrying the corpses of lost soldiers. Bring out your dead. Bring out your dead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is something that I even I'm guilt I'm guilty of not doing enough of this, mm -hmm. including opportunities of role play that's not tied to what's the story of what I'm what story I'm trying to tell. And shame on me because it makes sense that you should even if when they're doing the random traveling, maybe you you have a D20 table and you roll in only two of the encounters are actually rob or get attacked. The rest are you run into a guy with a broken wagon and the cleric casts mending and who fixes it up and he's super grateful and learn that he runs the 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 uh, uh, shop in, in in one of the big stores and he gives you a discount because you fix the stuff you know mm -hmm. there's so much more that should be happening uh, during travel and when you're walking through towns and cities that's not just related to somebody pick, picking your pocket or somebody of importance having a perfect quest for you. you have anything to add to that? I don't trust this beggar. I roll in insight. Okay, you roll a nine. He seems normal. I still don't trust him. <laughs> Every player ever, right there. I even when they roll nineteen, we're like there's still something yeah. sketch. So he sus. Yeah. All right. Uh, that'll do it for our dungeon master of the podcast. Well met on the road. Yep. Our player tip of the podcast is. Don't, Don't be a dick. dick. And you can avoid dickitude by checking out this awesome combo called the Urban Druid. This combo focuses on multi-classing of the Spore Druid plus the Battlesmith Artificer. Now, Circle of Spores can do necrotic damage to a creature that moves within 10 feet of them or starts their turn with their reaction. Yep. That's great. Additionally, it can increase the damage with a wild shape feature, causing weapons to do necrotic damage. So right off the bat, we can use our reaction to inflict damage, and we can make our weapons do extra damage. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of it being a whip, too, because then the, mm -hmm. the spore is 10 feet and the whip is 10 feet. What about this extra spit? You want to delve into the battlesmith there? Uh... Yep, the battlesmith gets a steel defender that can, turn, that can take turns right after you using bonus actions. You can use intelligence of dex or strength with a magic weapon, which the officer can create. Nice. And this means you can use your action, bonus action and reaction to do damage on your turn. Not to mention, you can utilize a seal defender's reaction to impose disadvantage. And if you're very small enough, double, doubles as a ride. Oh, my goodness. So this is really, really cool. I like that. Play like a gnome or something. You ride, you create this area of effect when somebody comes at you. Yep. This has got to be one of the most optimized turns that I can think of because it's hard to include your reaction in yep. most uh, most games um, and most classes. So this kind of combination certainly allows you to get the most out of that. I love the idea of, of being a small one riding on top of your, yep. your steel defender's uh, back, which is pretty cool. Um, this is a pretty straightforward combo. It's obviously designed for, uh, doing a lot of damage. Um, is there anything else you think that would really go well with this? Okay. Baby girl. Yeah. I mean, there's quite a few things you can, you can do with this. Ha! What the beast master wishes he was. <laughs> oh, Darwin. Um, that is savage as hell. Shots fired. <laughs> you mean the Drake Warden is what the Beastmaster wishes it was? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so this is uh, pretty straightforward. This is definitely for the Power Gamer listeners out there. Uh, if you enjoy it, uh, you use it, or if you tried something similar or even have any better ideas, please let us know. Mm -hmm. 
Um, that'll do it for our player tip of the podcast. Don't, Don't be, be a, a dick. dick. And you can avoid dickitude by optimizing your urban druid. Um, speaking of uh, sending us, you know, your your thoughts on improvements. Um, do you got an unearth tips and tricks you'd like to submit? Well, did you know you can visit our website and <laughs> God damn that picture? <laughs> um, you can visit our website and click a button to submit your ideas. Super, super simple. Um, we've made it a single button press now. <laughs> Smart. Uh, that's great. Um, Kiefer says, I don't know what I've missed out on, but every session zero I run is a one on one. That is pretty cool. Um, it does take away from the. Uh, yeah, for technical reasons, apparently. Oh, um, it does take away from their ability to interact as a group, yeah. but that's only um, that's well to me that's not minor, but that's the minor thing, especially if you plan it out. Hey, <laughs> Andrew, add Muffer Kung Fu because he can use your key points while you're wild shape. Oh, Kung Fu Panda! Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Ian, would you like to tell us uh, every episode we give away fat loots? Ian, would you like to tell us what we're giving away today? Today we're giving away my immortal loneliness by Jessica. Mark from an Ellie Fontek. I am sorry for stalling your names. <laughs> Characters investigate a decrepit mansion in order to cleanse it of necrotic energy and discover the occupant has unanticipated tastes. In this any animated adventure for best organized play 2020, that's huge. Unleash inner gothic and take the time to smell the bloody roses. And ha, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And their winner today is Oregon Pink Rose. Woo! Uh, uh, Oh, they got, that's a bros in the name. All right. <laughs> I got it. That's a happy accident. <laughs> Can that win? Not a problem. Head to CritAcademy.com and submit and subscribe for your chance to win. Mostly subscribe, not submit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, just just a friendly reminder from Dalsinia about our power builds. Um, these can be NPCs too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, congratulations. If you enjoy the show and you would like to support us, please head on over to CritAcademy.com. Maybe check out some of our content. There's been a lot of links flowing in the chat. Um, follow us on social media. Leave a review. All that good stuff. Um, I just want to take a moment to all of you that are watching and say thank you for spending your time listening to us talk Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, we, we love you guys. Um, you keep making this uh, show possible. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh. <laughs> all right. That'll do it. I am your host, Justin. And I'm your host, Ian. Thanks for listening. Keep your blades sharp and spells prepared, heroes. <laughs>